on Nova Legends podcast. I have uh, emergency room doctor and former MLS player Robbie Russell. Uh, uh, Robbie uh, wrapped up his uh, MLS career, uh, also uh, a career in Scandinavia. Um, went to George Washington Med School and um, and UVA uh, re residency. Finally, finally saw the uh, light. Uh, but now is a, a, a local is a doctor here locally. Uh, Robbie, great to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Julian. No, oh, of course. Well, you have a fascinating background, uh, Robbie, uh, and I know I'm not the first person to tell you this. You were born in in Ghana, lived there until your teen years, I believe, and you then you went to uh, or close. Uh, mm -hmm. We we can clear all this up, and then uh, mm -hmm. and then you went you end up in Amherst, Massachusetts, I believe, and you uh, played soccer there, high school soccer, Gatorade Player of the Year, uh, at least Gatorade All American, um, and then you end up going to Duke. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I guess. You know, you couldn't get into some of the other schools that you <laughs> <laughs> you ended up going to Duke. Had a great career there. All ACC, all four years, all American, second team, all American, two years. Uh, you know, went to Iceland, uh, uh, an emerging soccer country. Now, I guess it's, it was just getting started on that path that led it all the way to the Euro, uh, mm -hmm. Euro semifinals, I believe, uh, a mm -hmm. couple time years, a couple competitions to get back. Um, also played in Nor Norway and Denmark. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Those are rabid soccer countries for, for folks who don't know. Uh, and then you ended up with a Duke, uh, a fellow Duke alum at Real Salt, Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. um, you won an MLS Cup there, and you, you scored a game-winning penalty, which must have been an unbelievable feeling. Uh, and then you ended up at DC United, mm -hmm. and you uh, uh, finished your career in DC. Now, Robbie, did I get did I get most of that correct? You got. A, you did a lot more research than most of the the other like you know journalists <laughs> and interviews have done in the past. So I, I really commend you on that. Um, the only kind of blip was that you know my parents were both aid international aid workers. Okay. And so my mom is Ghanaian, my dad is American, hmm. um, and that's where they met um, while he was working for the Peace Corps. Um, and so I was born in Ghana, um, but then they through their work traveled kind of all around the world. And so between that period of like, you know, you know, one year old till about, I would say, 14, um, I lived in, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, I lived in Ghana, I lived back and jumped back and forth to the States a couple of times, um, you know, spent some time in France for a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, we moved around quite a bit, kind of those early years. So I wouldn't say I was like in Ghana the entire time. But that, that was only the one that was a little bit of a difference. Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, I was I was I was going to think, you know, Ghana is a great soccer country. I know you probably were cheering along in 2010 when they made that be that beautiful run. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was thinking maybe a lot of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, your your ability and you know how to play the game maybe arose in Ghana. But it sounds like to me you were all over the place. So it was, hard, it was probably hard to get in the rhythm. Well, I would say you're not necessarily that far off because my mom, um, she actually remarried uh, my dad. And so she, I have brothers and sisters. I have uh, two brothers and a sister that are from a different dad, um, but we grew up kind of all together. There, um, the difference means that there's a huge age gap between us. So my oldest brother is kind of like 18 years older than me. And my oldest sister is like, you know, 16 years older than me. And my brother after that is like seven years older than me, but they were all full Ghanaian. Um, and so my oldest brother was an exceptional athlete. Um, he uh, was a, a track athlete and a soccer player. Um, he actually has two, you know, oh, how many? I think he has four Guinness World Records, actually, wow. um, and some very unusual talents. And I'll tell you about him if you'd like to know. But yeah, sure. Um, he was kind of like the main athlete in the family. And so he was the soccer player also. And so growing up, I always kind of looked up to him and him his playing. And so his playing influenced my playing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then whenever we would take our trips back to Ghana, I, of course, would be the little kid trying to keep up with all the big kids on the pickup soccer field. And they'd make me look ridiculous, e even though, you know, back home in the States, I was a pretty decent soccer player, you know. Um, so I would say definitely Ghana had some very strong like influences on the on the way I played and, you know, my development. Yeah. How does a player develop in Ghana like like your brother? And I'm, maybe it's probably changed over over time. But it was just, uh, I, I had a guy on uh, Misrael the other day. Um I don't know if you know Tamir Linhart, local soccer player. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but he just played street soccer and he was just playing in the street. And so how, how do players develop in Ghana? Is, is it really organized into academies or they just play, they just play where they can? 
so that's all that's it's evolving and changing um once uh i would say primarily european soccer teams see you as being kind of a gold mine for you know resource you know for athletes um they will eventually come in and start developing what are called academies in the area now you know every country has its own professional league as well and so sometimes you know youth players in ghana and and, and you know my brother, because he's so much older than me, I, you know, I'm not entirely versed as to what his, you know, youth upbringing was like. Um, but from, you know, what we've talked about, you know, he started off playing for his local school team. And then he would be seen by the local like pro teams and maybe get a tryout here and there. And then if you're really good, you'd probably get invited to an academy where you would go kind of overseas to kind of get education and training. And so it all kind of depends on how old you are when you kind of hit your uh i don't know golden year you know so that where you know everyone sees that you've got some talent everyone sees that you have some ability and depending on that is where you can then enter into that kind of professional system so if it's younger age groups and maybe it's the local you know club team youth team that then joins you with the local professional team and you play with their youth system if it's at a little bit older age maybe then you I've gone through the upper, I you know, upper schooling, and you played for your club team a little bit, but then now you're getting picked up by the international kind of professional teams. Hmm. Um, but oftentimes in African countries, the best way to kind of develop your soccer career is to go abroad, um, and so most of those players are looking to get that overseas kind of, you know, invite to either an academy or to a professional contract. Hmm. It's if Ghana closely related. I- I think it's it's a former Commonwealth country, right? So is it is it closely it is. is it closely related to the British teams, uh, the English? It teams? is, yeah. and so you know, with the whole European Union stuff that happened and Brexit and that sort of thing, it it, it makes it so that Ghanaian players are much more likely to go to kind of the UK. Um, but um, you know, there are plenty of Ghanaian co- you know players that are outside of that. It just makes it a little bit harder getting visas and status unless you have either a, a parent or some sort of other way to get citizenship. Um, so when the EU was present, it was much easier for Ghanaian players to kind of move to other countries in the EU because they could get their UK citizenship with some relative ease. Um, but, um, you know, that's all changed now. Um, but they still need to get citizenship in order to kind of be not considered an international or foreign player. Um, if they are considered an international foreign player, it has certain restrictions to the type of contracts and stuff they can sign, um, but they can go that route as well. Yeah. Well, did you have uh, African heroes like Roger Miller uh, from the Cameroon, the West African uh, players, and George Weah? And I, I guess Michael Essien is probably your age, so I guess he probably wouldn't have been your hero. But did you have those African players that you that you looked up to? Um, I did. Um, it, it was primarily Abedi Pele was you know the the big African star that you know my brother grew up watching and actually my brother played with a couple times um, when he was growing up Um, and then of course the Africa Cup of Nations is going on right now um, and Ghana has not had some results that were as satisfying Um, and so they had kind of what I consider to be a very early exit um, and that was very disappointing Um, but uh, you know, growing up, I think he was the big star because, you know, he was I'm trying to think he played in England for a little while and then he played in France. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he played for this Marseille team that was like unbelievable. Um, and so, you know, Abedi Pele was really the kind of African star, Ghanaian star that, you know, I grew up knowing about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know, with my age group, um, Manchester United was really the big team kind of for me growing up. Um, and so like Mark Hughes, you know, those types of players are always big. Um, I think my favorite player of all time is probably Zinedine Zidane. Um, but you know, uh, having a, the career I had, one of the really amazing moments I had was that when I was playing in Norway and we qualified it for UEFA champions league group stages, one of the teams we were playing in the group stages was Real Madrid. And that was the team that he was, he was on the Galacticos, right? Um, now, of course, I, I never, he, he never played against our team because we were kind of the lowly bottom of the group. And so he was arrested during those games. But just knowing that, you know, playing against the same team that he's on was just an honor in itself. But then, of course, on that team, you have players like Beckham, Roberto Carlos. And so, I mean, there's, I, I would say, um, 
one, my soccer has kind of taken me to a lot of different places. And two, I've gotten to meet some really amazing kind of special players, which is really cool. Um, and, you know, I, but I would say the only player that I would say I was starstruck by was probably Zidane. Zidane. I think Zidane may have played with Pele. Uh, I believe he played for, for Marseille at one point, but maybe they didn't overlap before you no. got to Real Madrid. You know, it's, it's interesting about, uh, and we can get into this later, but it's interesting about uh, soccer, uh, actually the way the rest of the world handles sports, in that you can come from a smaller country and through the Champions League can qualify and you can play against the very best in the world. Um, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Ajax fan and that's, you know, Ajax is not a small club, but you know, <laughs> several years, yeah, but several years ago, they got to, they got to the quarter the semifinals and they play against Tottenham and they hadn't done mm -hmm. that in a long time. Yeah. And it was just great because, uh, you know, they dominated and, you know, that can't happen in American sports. And I know you went through yeah. this when you came to the MLS, it's all draft. There's no relegation. There's no, uh, I guess we are tied to the other, um, uh, America pro leagues in some ways they play the Comcast or whatever they play, but yep. it, it's not the same as in Europe where it's a, a, a Icelandic team can go all the way through the group stages and can, can get into the Champions League or even Europa, mm -hmm. and you can play against some of the best players in the world, or you know, make, at, at least one, some of the best teams in the world. Well, so there is actually a way. So the reason it's called UEFA Champions League is because it's the Champions League of UEFA, which is the European continent. Um, and so those teams have their tournament. Our tournament is called the CONCACAF Champions League. So it's the same tournament, but in CONCACAF, which is then kind of, you know, uh, Central American countries, Mexico, uh, the United States, North America, uh, Canada. Um, and so uh, we have our own certain, you know, same team kind of club tournament, but because our clubs aren't as massive as like the Chelsea's, the Bayern Munich's, you know, it doesn't get as much attention. So UEFA is definitely by far the kind of preeminent club tournament. Now, all of these tournaments then um, kind of uh, culminate in what's called the club world championships. And so that's when you'll see, you know, a team from, you know, uh, uh, South America versus a team from Europe. Um, but there's really only like four or five teams that make it into the club world championships. Um, and because of that, it's not a very touted kind of trophy, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's, and, in, and the timing of it, of it is, is that it doesn't happen during the main season. It happens more during the off season. And so when those play, those teams are playing that club world championship, you often see them playing like their, you know, uh, I'm not going to say like their tryout players they're you know it's during the middle of the off season so they're trying to like recuperate all of their big stars oftentimes don't play and so yes it's like a big you know trophy to say they won the club world championships but the one that really gets the notice and gets the the attention is the uefa champions league championship and that's what everyone watches but that's not to say that all the other continents and the, all the other regions and fifa don't have their own tournaments like asia has their own south america has their own and so you know if you're from those areas to hear you say that like oh you know uh bayern Munich is bigger than river plate or you know these other teams don't tell them that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but of course, UEFA is where, you know, all of the attention is, all the TV rats are, all the money is, and all the biggest stars are. You know, I forgot that they are, they are all tied together through the Club World Cup. I remember one year I watched, and, uh, you know, I, I just started following soccer 2010 because my son um, was a player. And I, I remember DR Congo, they they had some upsets. I think they upset either the European team or maybe the uh, the Brazilian, the South American champion. I forgot mm -hmm. which one. It was huge because the, the 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 Congo team didn't have any European players at all. Yeah, they had some investment from I think a European um, mogul. But but anyway, that it, there is opportunities for that. And I f I forgot they are tied together. And I know I believe Corinthians has won the World Club World Cup or, or Brazilian mm -hmm. team. Has um, you know, has won it. But so anyway, to, to get back to your career, when did, when did you um, realize that you were something special in soccer? At some point, um, you know, it wasn't just playing with your brother. You started playing with your peers and you and you, you must have been better than them. Huh. Uh, it's really hard for, you know, me to say exactly when I first realized I could, you know, make it as a pro type of thing. Um, you know, I had moved back from living abroad in a bunch of different places when I was about 14 years old. 
um, I moved back to the States in Amherst. Um, my parents had gotten divorced at that time. And so they decided that my, you know, I moved back with my mom um, and she moved back to our house in Massachusetts, which is how I ended up in Mass. Um, both my brother, my sisters were all living in Mass at the time. Um, they weren't going to college at UMass. And so when I got there, um, you know, I was, you know, the foreign kid who had lived in a bunch of other countries and never really lived in the States. And so it was right at the kind of end of middle school, beginning of high school type of, you know, situation. And so I was introducing myself to all these American kids who, you know, I maybe talked a little funny, I dressed a little funny, um, but I could play, I could play soccer, right? So the best way for me to kind of integrate myself into, you know, the social scene was to just be an athlete, right? Um, and so I played soccer there. I, I didn't know anything about clubs. I didn't know anything about high school soccer. I didn't, you know, I, I just was kind of thrown into it. Um, luckily, my brother, who was going to college then, kind of gave me a little bit of information as to like how the soccer scene kind of works in the U.S. Um, so I, I ended up just starting to play for like my school team, um, which was not a very good team in our kind of high school league. And then got invited to a couple club teams who then took me to like those, you know, big tournaments like the DC Cup and those sort of things. And that's where I ended up getting scouted by college recruits. Um, but uh, I, I just remember, you know, soccer was just one of the easiest ways I could integrate and get friends. And so I just liked playing it because I, you know, it, it helped me kind of get through all the tougher parts of like high school and the tougher parts of, you know, that social scene that's you know, right around that age, people are just developing their personalities, developing, and, and so it, it can be difficult. Um, and so for me, soccer gave me that, that outlet. Um, I knew I was a good player, but, you know, there's always, there's tons of good players growing up. You know, there's always those guys you play with, they're like, oh, he's amazing. And that guy's really good. You know what I mean? And so you never really know what people are thinking of your own play, other than like, you keep on making the next team, you keep on making the next team. And, you know, people invite you to play and, you know, I just kind of jump from team to team to team as, as you know, people ask me to. Um, and it, it wasn't until I would say probably college where I kind of realized, okay, maybe I can try and go pro because I actually had a couple agents call me and that was like, whoa, what? Um, <laughs> but I always thought, you know, everyone tells you like the average, you know, professional soccer players lifespan is what, like five months. So I was like, Oh, maybe I'll, you know, play for a, a year or two and get cut. And then I'll try, have to go get a day job and, you know, try and figure out then. But like, you know, while it's going on now, just enjoy it and, and go for the ride, you know? Um, so, yeah, I would say there's never any really point when I was playing where I was kind of, oh my God, I'm going to be, you know, pro. It was more of like, oh, they're asking me to join the team. They're accepting. And so maybe it'll last a month. Maybe it'll last a year. Maybe it'll last, you know, 10 years. Um, but initially you never know how long it's going to last. And, you know, one year turned into two years, turned into five years, turned into 14 years. So, yeah. um, I got pretty lucky that way. <laughs> yeah. You had a great career. How did your, how did your upbringing impact your ability? Like, would you have been the same player if you, if you were raised at Amherst and did the, did the, did the rec, did the club, or did the fact that you were born in Ghana, you had a brother, half brothers that were mm -hmm. tremendous athletes um, you had this really eclectic upbringing. You think that had had something to do with you being a great athlete, or do you think it would have been the same thing if you'd been born to the same parents in um, Amherst? So it's, it's a great question. Um, it's kind of that what if, shoulda, coulda, woulda <laughs> question. Um, I don't know what to say because I didn't go down that path. So yeah. who knows? Um, I do think that the experiences I had, especially living abroad made it so that when I then moved abroad in the early part of my careers, it, it wasn't as much of a shell shock that like, you know, you moved to another country, you don't speak the language, you don't know anyone, you don't look like the other people, you know, you know, nearby. And so you, you have to kind of learn to be on your own pretty successfully. Otherwise you will kind of, you know, fall and crash. And, you know, that's what happens to a lot of players that go internationally is that it's not necessarily the football that, that destroys it. It's the fact that, you know, they're just living in such a foreign alien kind of culture that that then like makes it too much, you know? Um, so I think that helped a lot for my the beginning part of my career in terms of whether or not like being, you know, raised in the States or raised abroad will have changed my football career for the better or the worse. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I definitely think I had a special place for like African style players 
kind of growing up, which I know a lot of other countries don't necessarily appreciate. Um, and I, I remember watching kind of the U S world cup and watching the Nigeria team and, you know, and, and Cameroonian teams. And, you know, I loved the way they had like almost what I would call like a non-traditional dribbling style, you know, mm-hmm. it was, it's more body feints and, you know, uh, and, and so I, it, it gave me an appreciation for that style of soccer, um, which, you know, I always loved to emulate. And then whenever I got chances to play with my brothers, I always felt like we always played like that. Um, and so I definitely think all of my life and all of the things that kind of I went through p- played a big role in my development as a soccer player. It, it, it has to. Um, but whether or not it pushed me in a good direction or a bad direction, I don't know. I just know that it, it, it definitely fed into what ended up being a career I was really happy with. It's funny you mentioned I, t- I talked to a lot of basketball players. Um, most of my, I think a good percentage of my interviews are basketball players and a lot of played in Europe and they they mentioned what you mentioned and I did, I never considered this. No, are you grinding on the basketball court to try to make your way, learn the European way of playing the coaching, but you're grinding, you, just getting a bank account. Just the, the, yep. the little things that you do when you're living by yourself for the first time. Cause in college, a lot of times everything is really done for you. And you all of a sudden yep. you're by yourself away from family. Um, at least I guess now the internet makes social media makes things a little bit easier. How about uh, stylistically was your game any different because of the way you brought up? You think that, I mean, obviously it's uh, you know it's hard to say what if, but do you think when you got here you played a different way because you weren't raised in the club system necessarily from Massachusetts? I, I definitely think that's true. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of my understanding of how to move off the ball and how to work with other players on the field came from watching those teams that I idolized and watching those teams that I thought were the best in the world. Um, you know, I think I, I loved Manchester United growing up. But I think one of the, my favorite teams to watch was Barcelona with like the Iniesta, Xavi, Messi era um, and just the way they would kind of combine and their high press tactics. And it had the Dutch style, you know, I mean, I, I always idolized that. But then, you know, you watched, you know, teams like, you know, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and they had some kind of Dutch coaches at times. And, you know, they would also have their kind of attempts to play with each other that, you um, I remember watching the World Cup and 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 Kanu when he was playing for Nigeria and the way he's this you know super tall lanky footballer that like doesn't look to be like the most amazing athlete in the world and you know he had these huge steps would kind of make him look like he was fast but then his legs were moving very slowly because it was very long steps and when he would touch the ball it was so smooth and so silky that you know no one could ever get near it. Um, and I hadn't seen any European players that ever played like that. And, um, you know, just the way he moved the ball and, you know, the, the, y- you talk about like the old school kind of dribblers like Johan Cruyff and, you know, those kind of footballers, especially from the Dutch world. Kind of mechanic, know, kind of mechanical. In some yeah, way. but they would do things like, you know, the step over or like, and it was very much like you, you trained in those European styles where like they train you on those like five different moves and that was it you know, and now you add in like the South Americans, the Africans, they bring this flair, you know, and this, um, uh, you know, uh, the beautiful game, you know, like the, you know, Juego Bonita. And so you've noticed that football has evolved, you know, even from when we were younger to now where like the, the dribbling style, the, the way we deal with the ball, all of that's changing and it, it changes from year to year and generation to generation. And it's influenced by our big stars, you know, early on it's like Pelé, you know, and, 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 you know, Maradona. Now it's like Messi, you know, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, those types of players and they bring their own flair. And then all of a sudden you see the young kids practicing those moves, you know what I mean? And so I think every generation is influenced by the generation before it. Right. And, and the stars they watched and how they played to so then we then bring our own flair in and hopefully we pass on the next generation of footballers have their own flair, you know. Um, so I absolutely agree that like the, the people we watched growing up and the players we idolized growing up are make us who we are and make our game. But then we add in our own flair to kind of change it the way we want it to. Yeah, that was one of the beautiful things that I love about the beautiful game is that Every country or many countries have their own interpretation of it. This is things I've just learned over the last 10 years. But like, you know, the Brazilians with the attacking fullback and the flair that you mentioned, you know, the English more direct style, um, this Spain and 
through Barcelona and probably have, have adopted a tiki taka style. You know, the, and this happened in basketball over the last 20, 30 years. First, the Yugoslavians, their guards played different, mm-hmm. the big men played different. All the Eastern European big men played away from the basket in ways that American big men generally didn't do, even though we had yeah. some. And then it, in South America, the guards like o- Oscar and um, the guy who played for San Antonio. So when as basketball has become international, it's become more fun to watch because mm-hmm. when other countries had their own interpretation of our game, um, they changed it and they improved it. And then it's really changed the NBA today. And I think soccer has always had that. Soccer's mm-hmm. always countries always played differently. They had their own, and within a country, within probably within a county or a section. And that, that is the beautiful thing about soccer is all the different interpretations. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of those things where, you know, you'll notice if you watch the, the, the World Cup, whichever teams kind of do really well in the World Cup, especially the outliers, you'll notice that they had something special, something different, right? That kind of helped to give them that advantage. And then for the next four years, you'll notice a bunch of those players suddenly ending up at kind of big name clubs and they bring their influence to those big name clubs. And all of a sudden you see them on the world stage and now, you know, it changes and every World Cup seems to be the next impetus for the next big set of stars, you know. Um, and so you're, you're absolutely right. Like the games are always evolving. They're changing. The game we played when we we're kids is no longer the game they play now because it's so yeah. different. Um, and it's it's hard sometimes as a as a player, especially an older player, because you always want to be like, oh, we we knew how it, to do it. We were the best. You know, what I mean, our our generation really knew how to play. And these young kids, they don't know what they're doing. They're too mm-hmm. soft. They're, you know, whatever excuse you want to make. But I honestly think if you threw you know an, an older style player at his height in the new game, it would be so different that it would take. A lot of adjustment and take a lot of you know right. understanding that these things are different things are moving faster or things are moving you know in different directions or these are the different kind of important zones but you're right the game's always evolving and that's almost the beautiful thing to watch um and so it's 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 a really fun thing that keeps you interested in the game um i think one of the you know the the, the sports that could probably use it a lot now is probably the nfl um they need a lot more kind of international flair, but it's such a difficult game to play in a, in foreign countries because there's so much equipment involved, that sort of thing. But every other sport you can think of has that 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 growing international element that's bringing so much. Hockey has always had it a little bit. Soccer has always had it a little bit. Um, basketball, it's growing now, you know. And and so I think the more people and more countries you have playing, it, it it just makes it more fun. Yeah, I think rugby will prevent NFL from truly ever being an international Possibly, sport. Yeah. It's 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 similar, like but it's, baseball, it's, cricket, rugby, football. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just I just think it's uh, rugby is cheaper for uh, to play. It's easier to it's, and it's there's less injuries somehow. Even though I would never want my me, I would never want to play. I would never allow my my <laughs> my, my son to play. But um, to get back to 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 you for 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 a second, um, you made the decision to go to Duke. Um, all, all joking aside, an amazing institution. So this this is 1990, uh, uh, 1996, 1997. Mm-hmm. Yep. So obviously at that point, you probably didn't know that you were a future pro. So there was no consideration given to maybe trying to play in Europe or going back to Ghana. I mean, you were always going to go to college and then also yeah. play soccer. Is that is that, tr- is that right? Yeah, and, and that comes a lot from my mom. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom was very much... Uh, not a huge fan of being an athlete. Um, and so I think for her, it didn't matter how well I was playing or how many kind of accolades I got playing soccer. She was like, the only thing I ask you to do is get your college degree. And then after that, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. And so I think, you know, a lot of players kind of were considering going, you know, the MLS was just getting kind of founded right around then. And so a lot of players were kind of entering as younger or, you know, leaving school early or that sort of thing. I think, you know, for me, that was never an option. Um, you know, once I got into college, my mom was like, you're finishing, you know, no matter what happens, you're finishing. And so, um, you know, uh, when I when I got into Duke, it was with the understanding that I was going to kind of be there for the four years. And hopefully, you know, I got I was blessed to have soccer be able to pay for it, which was a, a big, you know, I wouldn't have been able to go to a school like that 
um, you know, had I not gotten a scholarship. Um, and so, you know, my mom was all about taking every advantage of kind of being in that environment. And so my plan had been, you know, doing playing soccer and then kind of getting my degree and then doing what all the other kind of athletes were doing at the time is, you know, working on like a liberal arts degree and then going into like, you know, I banking or, you know, one other kind of finance and then kind of doing whatever they did with that. And so that was, that was my plan. Like I was just going to kind of take advantage of the degree and kind of go with it. And then when I ended up, you know, having that first agent call me and say, Hey, you know, I, I think you could be, pro let's try and see if we can get you going someplace um after i graduated the plan was you know let's go on trial in europe because i wanted to play in europe that was what my plan was um and so you know I, I took a shot at it but the entire fallback plan was you know to to go back into finance or go into i banking and, and you know work a nine to five job and that was it <laughs> well Let's let's get back to Duke for a second. Now uh, you're going south. Uh, uh, Durham has got very tricky race relations. Um, but, you know, Charlottesville is, is uh, the same way. And I, I went. I was class of '88 at UVA, and when I got there in '84, uh, black students had only been there for 13 years. The first mm. uh, class, women had only been there for 13 years. It was a very different time for me. Now I mm. think things have probably changed a little bit in the 10 years between when I went to college and you went to college. But what did you think about Duke when you when you first get there? I think you're biracial, Robbie. Is that mm -hmm. right? yep. Yeah. So what was your uh, how did you feel about Durham and what was your experience like in Duke in terms of social in terms of social aspect? So uh, Duke in itself, um, you can almost consider it a walled city. Um, mm -hmm. The university is is separated off from the rest of the the, the town of Durham. Um, now I know there's been some inroads in terms of trying to kind of bridge that, but it felt very much like, you know, Duke has an East campus and a West campus, and both of them are surrounded by a wall. Yes, it's only like a three foot high wall, but it's still a wall, you know what I mean? Um, and so uh, there was very little kind of integration of the students into the local community very much at the time. Now, Durham has grown as a city, um, you know, the entire triangle area has grown. Um, and so, you know, I, I, you know, this is for us, you know, school is so far back now, you know, we're now decades later. And so things are very different now. But um, for when I was there, it very much felt like, you know, the Duke students were separated from the, the rest of the city and there wasn't very much interaction and there's very little kind of local community engagement. Um, uh, you know, um, I ended up having a incoming class of soccer players that came in with me. Um, that uh, a large percentage of them were actually African-American or mixed or, you know, um, darker skin tones, so to speak. Um, and so I felt like I had a very close-knit group in my freshman class that helped me kind of through that aspect of things. And because we were so tight, um, we supported each other. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, 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 it was very helpful having that with me, you know, when I came in. Um, one of my other kind of, you know, freshman year classmates is actually, his name is Niamar Amamu. He was actually Ghanaian parents also. Hmm. Um, and since then, there's been uh, several kind of Ghanaian players that have come to play at Duke. And so um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I think whenever you have colleges that are working, at least in some aspects, to kind of diversify and to bring in a little bit more kind of outside influence, it it makes the entire school system better because it one helps the, the, the students that are there that are maybe kind of needing that connection. And then it also brings the students that have already been there already there. It opens up their mind up to the rest of the world, you know? Um, and so um, that was something that I did enjoy at Duke is that, um, you know, oftentimes they're bringing in the best and the brightest, but they're not just bringing them in from, the, you know, local areas, you know, they're bringing in from abroad, they're bringing in from international communities. And so um, I, I, I always applaud whenever the next, you know, incoming class, you know, of all the schools that I've been to, whenever they have a more diversified kind of student population, I think they're growing in the right direction. Yeah, Duke as a private school has an easier time with that than UVA. UVA has all these uh, rules with diversity. It makes it challenging to keep that diversity 
going. And and I want to I want to get back to Duke, but I just as you were talking, I'm reminded, um, you know, 30 years ago, it seems like almost all the blacks, uh, African Americans who played soccer, were actually either African, they were from the Caribbean, um, you know, they they rarely Jamaica, they really were African Americans. Like we all we played basketball, we played baseball, we played football. It's just amazing nowadays when you see all these African Americans with 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 parents uh, that are they were also you know, they weren't immigrants as well, and they're playing soccer now. It's it's it's, it's exciting to see so many uh, uh, black players uh, playing soccer and playing it really well. It is. It, it absolutely is. And I think what the U.S. has, and I still think needs a lot of work on, is introducing and making the the game available to all echelons of our kind of socioeconomic kind of groups. You know, um, the reason I think a lot of kind of African countries, South American countries are so good at creating so many amazing players is because it's, you know, it's the beautiful game that's played by everyone. And so um, if you are able to see all those special talents that come up from anywhere, you then kind of pick out the diamonds in the rough. Um, and I think that's something that the U.S. has struggled with. Um, the U.S. youth system is a pay-to-play type of system, and it's very hard um, for you know someone who doesn't have the socioeconomic kind of backing to then make it in the U.S. system because it's just so expensive yeah. in the youth system to play. And so I think that's something that uh, European countries have done a better job of than us. Um, they have, you know, a, a system that kind of integrates all of their professional leagues. And so that, you know, money that goes to the biggest team, it finds its way and trickles down to the smallest team. Um, you know, one of the ways that I thought that FIFA kind of does a great job of this, you know, even with of all of its issues and all of its corruption, you know, I remember when I signed my first FIFA contract, when I signed in Europe, I saw in the contract that there was money going from my signing bonus and from the team signing bonus that was trickling down to every single team I had played with growing up. And that included, you know, uh, I remember on my first contract, I saw that I had a, a line in there saying that Arlington optimists, which I had been on the team for like, I want to say three months in a six month period of being back in the States when I was like, I want to say like seven or eight years old. And it was the local club team that I played here in Arlington um, for like three months, they got, I don't know how the money got there. I don't know how they found them, but because they were registered, um, they ended up getting some of my signing bonus when I signed my first professional contract. And yeah. so, you know, there's ways where, you know, the international game has tried to kind of facilitate money tripling from the top teams down to the lowest team possible. And I think the more we can do that, the more we give access to young people, especially who are, you know, black, brown, you know, that sort of thing, who don't have the socioeconomic footing that a lot of other people have in this country. Um, it gives them an opportunity to play the game. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, so when my son, my son played in Holland for uh, three, three summers, a couple of weeks with a team. And I remember I'd go to games, they play, you know, local Dutch teams. And there's always a lot of scouts of other teams at the games. So I'm like, I just figured there was scouting, scouting these American kids. These are new kids. So I, was, I would talk to some of these scouts, all of them very, very friendly. Um, they, they love the fact that the Dutch teams are always beating us. But, um, <laughs> but I, it was so efficient how these kids would go from a small club in, in, in uh, uh, maybe a rem more remote part of Holland. They go to a bigger regional club and then maybe Ozed would, would take them and then Ajax would come get them maybe. And Ajax would send transportation to pick them up and bring them there. So even if they lived 60 miles away up north or whatever, it was all efficient. And we're in, in America, if, if you, you get your kids private training, you get them on the best clubs, you drive them to the, to the, 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 the best programs 40 miles away, you got to really be involved in your kid's uh, career to really get in that leg up, even though, you know, great talent is, is, is going to shine through at some point, but there's so many ways we can give our kids an advantage. In Holland, the kids are funneled to the right places all the time. They are constantly scouting everyone else's kids and the money changes hands. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll get part of that money if they become pro, as you said. So it is so efficient how the rest of the world does this. Well, I do think there is, 
one is that, you know, especially, and you notice this when you live in Europe and you go to those two areas is that everything's like two, three hours away, right? Like the countries are much smaller, right? Yeah. They're, they're dealing with smaller distances. Um, the other part of it is, is that they have a football system in place that connects their pro teams together. And so even if you are, you know, playing with this small rural club team, that's, you know, in the middle of, you know, Northern Holland, and it's like their little pub team, you know, it's an established team. And so when you play there, it's in the best interest of that team to then sell that player, whenever they have that little diamond in the rough to sell that player, because that's that sale, then pays for their budget for the next five, 10 years, you know, and so um, it, it's, it's created a system where if you aren't the big dog, you know, you want to sell your players to the big dog, because he will then pay you for them. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things that kind of at play that, you know, wouldn't work in the U.S. system necessarily just because of distances. Um, but and, you know, a, a big part of what I think the U.S. could do better is integrating the professional league, which we think is growing and is kind of been growing exponentially almost um, since it started to then our youth soccer system. They are two separate entities now. And I don't think that's necessarily in our best interests. And we're trying to find a way to, like, integrate the two. Um, but, and this, I don't know whether good or bad, but U.S. youth soccer is one of the most successfully financial stable institutions in, you know, all of sports, and they are not going to give up their rights to our youth system. And so however way we figure out to kind of coordinate those two, I think would be beneficial, but it's just not the same system as they have in Europe. You know, they're two separate entities. And so I don't know how we bridge them together and right now i don't think we're doing it well but you know i'm i'm not working in the mls i'm not part of that kind of world and i have friends that are and i know that everyone thinks about it and everyone's talking about it um i just i just don't know what the solution is yet it's just so funny because we always we always have the debate about capitalism versus socialism kind of u.s economics versus like the european model and it just seems like in terms of sports it seems like they have it right. And they do the same thing in basketball as well. Um, and uh, they're able to define players, they're able to keep interest, you know, with the relegation and promotion, the games are always meaningful. Well, not always, but they are, they're more often meaningful. Um, but uh, but anyway, we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. I want, I want to finish up with Duke. So you were there at Duke in the most amazing time of basketball. I think Duke won, your time you were there, I think they won three or four ACC tournaments. Yep. And, and they they won a national title, but you may have already left to go play pro because they beat Arizona, I think, in 2001. You may have already gone, but you must have really enjoyed those basketball matchups. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, so Duke, you know, undergrad at that time was only like six, 6,000, 7,000. So very small school, even though it, it has like a big footprint. Um, and so all the athletes kind of trained in the same facility together, all knew each other, you know, um, you know, I knew Shane Battier at the time, Corey Maggetti, Elton Brand, those sort of things. And so, you know, you know, watching those guys, you know, play at, you know, the highest levels of basketball, plus Coach K is just an unbelievable legend in all of sporting lore at Duke. Um, and so what was really cool at the time is that we had one of our teammates and actually this happened a couple years um one of our teammates when i first got there his name is jay heaps he was one of those walk-on guys that played on the team during this, all this and so um you know being able to go to games and watch games and kind of root for one of our own teammates at the time is really cool um and so it, it was just such a small knit community that you kind of all knew each other um but you know you know they're run um and especially in like 2001 you know the entire university just kind of blew up like everyone just you know loves duke basketball it's kind of the heart and soul kind of sport um for duke um and so uh whenever they're doing well everybody's happy um and so we we have all of our traditions of kind of burning the benches whenever you know we'd win championships and um there was definitely some some good times to be had off of, off of those runs yeah. Well, you know, uh, the Duke Carolina rivalry, you know, I interviewed George Lynch and I've, I've interviewed lots of like Grant Hill and lots of guys who played in that rivalry. And I'm always surprised. I, I, I thought maybe it was a lot of media hype, but those guys today still talk about that rivalry. Um, uh, like it's blood sport. I mean, it, it was a very serious 
brutal rivalry. They didn't like each other. They, they didn't talk off the off the court, which I find hard to believe. Um, did you have the same type of rivalry with North Carolina? Because I know I, I know women's soccer, they're unbelievable, but I believe in boys' soccer, they're good. Duke had won the national title in 86. You guys had a great program, um, and you'd won numerous ACC titles. Was it the same type of uh, uh, rivalry in soccer as well? Um, it was. Um, you know, every time you played Carolina, it was a special, like, almost – uh, it was a season within a season because, you know, you'd have to play them twice. And so it didn't matter kind of, you know, what else happened in the ACC as long as you beat Carolina. So, like, if you were doing really well in the ACC, you had to beat Carolina because you needed to keep up the standings. If you're doing poorly in the ACC, you had to beat Carolina because we can't let Carolina do well. We're better than <laughs> us. So um, at Duke, I think the Duke-Carolina rivalry, it transcends into the – it crosses over into the multiple sports. Um, uh, you know, I've never been, you know, one of those rivalry type guys, you know, I always kind of showed up to play regardless of who we were playing, but I do know that whenever we played Carolina, the coaches had a little something extra kind of special, um, at play. And if you did not do well, um, during that game, you would suffer for it later. <laughs> well, what, what, what were your impressions of college soccer? Uh, did it prepare you well for, for your overseas pro career um, or was it was just a matter of you were just developing as an athlete and could, you could have gone any which way. And I, and I know college soccer has probably gotten even more competitive over, over time. Um, I, I will say that the, the one thing I noticed, and, and this is primarily, I think, from going to a, a very elite kind of college soccer program like Duke, is that their sporting facilities were state of the art. Um, medical training facilities, fields, everything was state of the art, right? Um, and that's something I noticed when I, you know, went to Europe and played for kind of even the bigger clubs is that I, I, nothing ever rivaled how good the kind of facilities and the equipment was wow. at Duke. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think something about, you know, learning how to be an athlete, learning how to take care of yourself, learning how to talk to the media, learning how to, you know, those are all things that they help you with when you're going in college. And I think it's, it's kind of instrumental to kind of giving you um, an ability to kind of navigate that world that's so public um, where everyone's kind of paying attention to what you're doing and everyone's paying attention. And even now with like social media, you know, it's, it, there's access to athletes and access to famous people that is, it's a, it's a, it's a highest level it's ever been, you know? And, and I think sometimes it's very important to be able to control your messaging and control, you know, what gets out there because, you know, this is your personal life that you're dealing with. And, you know, you don't want everything out there and being able to understand all the different avenues is something that I think every athlete needs to be taught. Mm -hmm. It's not something you learn inherently. It's not something, and, and most athletes learn by like being burned somehow, something, you know, goes wrong, something goes out, you know, family issues, personal issues, whatever, um, they get burned and then they learn um, that, you know, it's a really important aspect of kind of being a public figure is knowing that you have to um, 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 know the avenues in which people can have access to you and being able to control how they have that access. And, and so that's something that I learned in college through our media department, through talking to, you know, the, our, our guidance counselors, that sort of thing. And that's one of the biggest things I think how Duke helped me develop as a player. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Robbie, you're, you're a tall right back. So I, I'm, I'm sure you probably play other positions probably at a young age. You're, I think you're six, two. Um, no. You're not. That, that was all, that was all the media. That's, that's six, two with like two pairs of cleats on. Right? <laughs> so you're six, about six foot. I'm about six foot, yeah. So did you, so you settle, did you settle in a right back at Duke, or had you, had you always played? That? I was a midfielder at Duke. Oh, midfielder. Okay. Yep. Um, and then I was a midfielder. You know, my first couple of years playing abroad. Okay. Um, I I would say, I think my transition to back happened when I went from my first team in Norway called Songdal, and I was sold to my the big team in Norway called Rosenborg. Um, when we were in Sungdal, I was a midfielder slash winger. Um, we were one of those bottom of the table teams. That's like kind of always fighting relegation, always looking, it was, you know, the first club I ever played at very small town in kind of the 
middle north of like Norway. Um, and uh, what ended up happening is that right after I got sold there, um, it was kind of partway through the season, we ended up going through a relegation battle mm. where we were avoiding relegation. And so they ended up, you know, you know, firing our coach and bringing in a new coach who was specialized in like avoiding relegation. Like he was this, he would change everything. And then just, you would just battle out the rest of the season to avoid relegation before you then decided to like do new things. And he decided to change us to a five back system. And so me being a winger slash midfielder got all of a sudden switched out to the outside back position, but it was part of a five back system. So when the ball was on your side, you were essentially the midfielder um, pushing forward. And so we would have these kind of wing backs that would just kind of fly up and down the field. Um, and that's where I got seen playing as a back by Rosenborg, which works as a four, three, three system. Um, and that's with the attacking kind of outside backs. And so they thought I would slot in perfectly to that outside back system from watching me play in Norway in that small club that was battling relegation. And that's when I got sold to Rosenborg. And that's when I started becoming a, an outside back. Right back has a lot of technical qualities that a midfielder has, uh, but you know they tend to be you know faster and, and maybe a little bit maybe a little bit better def defender. But did you miss in the midfield? You know you're always checking your shoulders. It's the challenge of trying to have a pass picked out uh, before the ball comes. Midfielders have to do a lot of thinking, whereas on the outside backs you have to think as well. But it's it's different, and you have a chance to you have a little more space to pick passes and crosses out. Did, did you miss the challenge of playing midfield or did you feel like this is, this is where I belong? Um, that's a really tough question. That's another shoulda, woulda, coulda <laughs> type of question. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. No, it's all right. Uh, I think, you know, I was, you know, at that time when I was being sold from Songdal to Rosenborg, um, I remember having conversations with my agent at the time. And, you know, he said that, you know, there's other clubs in Germany that are interested in you. There's other clubs, you know, in, in maybe the lower divisions of England that are interested in you, you know, and then we have Rosenborg that's interested in you. Now, um, you know, in my mind, playing in Champions League was my biggest goal. Like I had gone to Europe because I wanted to play in Champions League, you know, um, and, you know, for good or worse, I always felt as if, you know, if you had the opportunity, you have to seize it. And, you know, do I think that maybe transitioning to outside back was like the best thing for me in terms of my career? I, I don't know. Like I didn't pick another route, so I don't know. Did I love being a midfielder? Yes, I did. I loved being midfielder, but, you know, on your relegation team, you play where the coach puts you yeah. and yeah. then you do the best you can, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, when I went to Rosenborg, you know, I, I was getting to play, they were the perennial champions. I think they had won the championship like 10 years in a row. And so they were always playing in Champions League. They were like one of the preeminent teams in Scandinavia. Um, and so for me, it was, you know, I thought of it as like my biggest chance to be able to play on the highest stage in Europe, even though it was like a second tier league, you know? Um, and so when I went to Rosenborg, one of the things that I discovered is that their coach there, his name was Niels Arne Eggen. Um, he had created a system of how Rosenborg plays. And when you first got to the club, you got this book oh, gosh. that was thick. And it, it wasn't just your position that was defined in every single aspect. It was every position on the field. And then the history of the club and everything like there was, it was like a, a, a training manual for how to be a Rosenborg player mm -hmm. that every player gets right when they get there. And that was my first introduction to a championship style team. You know what I mean? Like a, a culture that like broods championships. I had felt it at Duke when we played, but I was on the soccer team. I wasn't on the basketball team, but you know, it, it, the entire sporting facility had that kind of feel to it. And then when I went to Rosenborg, I felt it there too, where when you have that kind of exceptional coaching style that like speaks to and gets the most out of their players and I remember playing in Rosenborg and, you know, every position was to find out as to what your role was. And as long as you fulfilled your role, then you were free to do whatever else you wanted. Right. Um, and, you know, the best players would kind of stay in their role. And then when it was time to shine, they would do the extra, 
you know, um, but it gave you such an understanding of how the team worked and how the team played that like you, you bought in, you know, you knew what your role is on the field and everyone knew where you're supposed to be and you knew where everyone else is supposed to be and you could make passes without looking. And, you know, it was an amazing feeling kind of being a part of a team like that, you know, um, whether or not, you know, being outside back was the best decision for me. I'm not sure, but I definitely loved that experience of being part of a championship culture um, where I got to see it develop, you know? Um, and so that's, that was a kind of like an aha moment for me where was the position, my favorite position in the world? No, was playing on a team where I felt like we were all streamlined, all moving together, all moving as a unit. That's, that's like lightning in a bottle. That's so hard to find, you know, and having success with a team like that brings it kind of to a, another level where you're just, when you're having success on the field, you love everything else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that was definitely like a feeling that happened when I went to Rosenborg, whether or not being a right back was my ideal position, probably not, mm -hmm. but um, I love playing for that team. Yeah. And you were, you were right back pretty much the rest of your career. Is that, is that correct? I was. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think the next big kind of step for me was um, about, I want to say like two years into my time at Rosenborg, I got a really bad injury um, Sorry, and I didn't play for almost two years. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, you know, of course, you know, lost a lot of muscle mass, gained a lot of weight, um, you know, and then it suddenly turned into like, I can't compete, you know, to get back on the squad at Rosenborg now because I'm just battling injuries all the time do I need to go to a different team um, to kind of revamp maybe a lower level team again to then kind of build myself back up again. And that's when I ended up going to Denmark where I got sold to a smaller club, um, another type of kind of mid table relegation battling type team, but it was a chance for me to kind of get fit again, kind of start playing again. Um, and that's when I went to Denmark. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, it's the decision that, you know, I needed to make at the time because, you know, I had, I had had three, by that time I had had three operations in six months on my left knee. Um, and, you know, I was, had issues kind of learning how to walk, let alone just run. Um, and so it was a, a really difficult couple of years in terms of my football career um, where I, you know, the questions weren't, when am I going to come back? The questions were, you know, will I walk again? Will, you know, I be able to do anything again, let alone play? Wow. Um, and so when I was able to play again, even going to Viborg, I, I see as it the opportunity because, you know, I struggled so much. Um, and so then I played at Viborg for a year or two and, you know, I, I, it, it, it was, a it was a great experience playing in a different kind of football style and kind of comparing it to how, you know, Rosenberg plays and how my first team Songdahl played. And so every time you went to these different teams, it's, it's a transition where you're playing a whole different style of football. And you don't realize how different it is until you're trying to play, you know? Um, and so played there for a couple of years. And then at that point I was, you know, I'd met my, my wife who I'd met in college um, had come over to kind of live with me. Um, so while we were over there and so she was teaching at the university in Denmark. Um, and so we started having the conversations about, oh, like, what am I going to do after football? Because, you know, I'd had this bad injury and I was kind of trying to come back to play and, I was having setbacks and, and that sort of thing. And so the thought was, well, you know, she can't practice. She's a lawyer, um, a U.S. lawyer. She was teaching at the university, but she wasn't practicing. And so, you know, where would she, let's, let's go back someplace where she can then start working. And then I can, you know, maybe go back to school or kind of figure out what I want to do next. And that's what led to us kind of leaving Europe and coming back to the United States um, because I, you know, I put out feelers through my agent about coming back to the MLS. And then at that time, um, Jason Kreis was taking over for Salt Lake. Um, and he reached out to me and said, you know, I think you'd be a perfect spot to kind of come in. And, and he was, he was rebuilding a team at that time because RSL had kind of just joined the league and had not been doing well for several years. And so they were doing like a revamp to try and build a, a new team. And so he he thought I would be a good addition to that rebuild. Wait, you got that one right. What was the transition like soccer culturally? So you're you're in Scandinavia, you're in these wonderful countries, uh, you know, 
you know, high life satisfaction index, whatever that, whatever that's called, but you have, you have clubs, you know, five, 10 miles away. You have incredible supporters, even with these small clubs, it's a soccer culture. Um, then you come to, you come to MLS, the league is, it's had its, its starts and stops. It's had its struggles. It, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it's taken off, up, off now, but at the time, you know, it was still trying to build its brand. The teams are all far apart. Um, you know, you have these big em empty stadiums sometimes. Yeah. I think many, many of the teams now play in smaller soccer stadiums instead of these the football stadiums are used for soccer. Was it a big adjustment and kind of was it kind of I don't want to say depressing, but was it a letdown on the play culturally when you came to MLS at the time? So there's two parts to that question. Mm -hmm. So initially when I was playing in Denmark. You know, I was one of the international players. I was one of the higher kind of branded players for the team. Um, and, you know, when the team was doing well, it had nothing to do with you. And when the team was doing poorly, it was all your fault. Right? Oh, wow. And so there's, 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 there's that aspect of when you're playing in Europe, like everyone knows what's going on with the team and everyone's watching and everyone from like the local grocer to the little kid that's walking down the street by you, like everyone has an opinion as to like what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. You know what I mean? And so wherever you go, the first conversation to say is like, oh, you know what you should do is, you know what I mean? And so there is something to that aspect of like being a professional player in a country where it's the main sport is that, you know, there's no escaping it. Like that, that's, everyone knows what's going on with the football team that that week or that day or who you're going to play next week and everyone has an opinion about it right now uh, it's it's a, a brilliant part of that because it's such a brilliant understanding like when you're playing and you're seeing something brilliant happen on the field and then you hear the fans recognize it even if it's not a goal even if it's not a you know what i mean and so having that sense of like everything is a you know they they know when all of the moments are big because, you know, they're just as football savvy as you are. You know what I mean? And so appreciating all the little aspects of the game that sometimes we don't, it's taken time for our, our, our country to kind of appreciate in aspects. Um, so there's, there's that, right? And so when I was leaving Denmark at that time, it was because I was in that transition phase of like trying to come back, trying to figure out what I was going to do next having the injury kind of dealing with that aspect of things and then, you know, trying to kind of, you know, set up my future. Um, and then I was gifted this opportunity at Salt Lake because they had just built a brand new soccer specific stadium. Oh, cool. Um, they had just invested in a brand new coach. They had just invested in some new young players, you know, um, Kyle Beckerman, um, Javi Morales, you know, these are all guys that they brought in with that kind of same set of guys. Um, uh, and, and so when I came back to Salt Lake and was like talking to Jason and taking a tour of the facilities to try and figure out if I wanted to come back here, I got that same, what's the word I'm looking for? Championship culture spark. Mm. I had that same feeling when I was hanging out in Salt Lake. Jason had come in and he had had full say in terms of how he wanted the locker rooms designed, how he wanted everything designed in the stadium. And so he walked in and, you know, he had his Latin quote up against the wall. He had his like plans out for everybody. And, and so I, I had that same sense of that. This is building something special, but what was amazing about coming back to the MLS is that the teams are so young here. Everyone is kind of, still discovering their identities compared to Europe when you have teams from like the 1800s, you know what I mean? Like, and so, you know, uh, it, it's one of those where we have so many young teams that are developing here that are kind of creating their identities that it's, everything's always new. Everything's always brand new. Um, now, am I saying that the MLS teams will eventually turn into kind of those European style teams with so much long history? I don't know, without the relegation system, without, you know, it's, it's the same teams over and over and over again, um, but they change coaches all the time. They're changing strategies, they're changing, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a different environment here. Um, I think here as well, um, the distances you're covering are almost like playing Champions League year round in Europe, you know? And so 
I, I definitely know that coming back from Europe and playing in that league where, you know, I'm flying five, six hours to go play a game for a weekend and then coming back for another game, you know, a week later, that's, that's unheard of, you know, in Europe. And that, that doesn't happen unless you're playing at the highest levels and you're, it's exceptional and it's exceptions to the rule. Whereas for us, that's like a standard Thursday, you know? Yeah. Um, and so every player that's come over from Europe, has noticed that difference has noticed and you'll always watch even the best players in the world they'll have that initial kind of burst of a bunch of good games and then they'll have a big lull and that's them transitioning to okay it's the long run lots of travel lots of trips and then usually they'll pick it up towards the end of the season but like Mm -hmm. there there is a transition and a different style that has to be played here because of that Mm -hmm. Um, not every game is super high intensity super aggressive all the time because of the fact that you just can't do that to the body over and over again Mm -hmm. Um, and so you know I I think there is a special style of football that has to develop in its own right here in the U.S. because of the nature of our country yeah well you know you hit you hit the the winning penalty to win the MLS Cup I'm sure one of the greatest moments of your career um, so you've experienced what it's like to win a championship in Europe, you win a championship by being at the top of the table. And it's a long grind at the end of, at the end of the day, whoever wins on top of the table, we, as we would say, whoever's on top of the end of the regular season wins the title and there's no playoffs. And then, you know, the playoffs is the next year. If you get on the champions league, it's, but it's a different tournament. So yeah. it's, it's a different way to win a title here. You have to qualify for the playoffs. Then you have to, play these best of whatever series. I guess they had those back then. It's very different. Um, do you like our system? Is this the only system that you think would work for Americans, the way we watch sports? Or do you do you think, like you mentioned a couple of times, you were on those relegation battlers teams. Is, do, you, do you think that we need that? Like that makes it exciting that you're fighting for your own city's existence. I mean, like when Santos went down in Brazil, there were riots in the street. Yeah. I'm like, guys get alive for me life goes on but do, do, do you think the european system would would add or do you think this is a system that americans would accept i don't know it's it's different um i would say that there is something to the relegation system in that it gives you a uh an any given sunday feeling of you know when you're at the bottom table of battling relegation it comes down to the, that game those, those games, those last couple games at the end of the season are the most important games of the entire season. doesn't matter what's happened before that. And you can still salvage a sense of victory, a sense of winning, even if you're at last place in the league. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's also devastating to a club. You know, clubs have gone into bankruptcy, gone into forfeiture be, by being relegated because they've banked so much on their, you know, staying up and that, that the, the, the economic boom that comes with that, right? And so it is a risky venture. And I think the MLS avoided that scenario because it made it a much more safe investment for the owners to know that they would always have a MLS club if they bought the club, right? And so there is something to the MLS and the brilliance of starting the single entity concept when they first designed the league. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the single entity concept, but the idea that like no team is individually owned, it's owned by the MLS and you just buy a stake in the MLS, right? Now we're gradually getting into more of an ownership style system, but the big lure to a lot of the owners was to come in and be able to say, if I bought Real Salt Lake, there's no chance I'm ever going to have, you know, a division three team because I paid millions to buy this MLS team. Right. And so that is a benefit for investors to say, Hey, and so that, that to start off was a brilliant move. And I think it's what led to the league kind of being financially viable for so many years. It's now moving forward. But do I say, I miss that kind of being at the bottom of the table and still salvaging victory to keep your team up or, you know, yes, those are brilliant. And so it's, it made it so that regardless of where you were, there was always a battle to be fought. You know what I mean? Even if you had no chance of making the playoffs like we have here in the States, it doesn't matter. You're still fighting for something else. And so the bottom teams are still fighting because of the fact that they have something to play for. Um, The only like 
experience, I would say, in Europe that kind of is somewhat comparable to the playoff system is cup, right? When you play in the cup over in Europe, you st- you know any team on any given day can win the cup, and any yeah, team, cool. team is allowed to play. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so there is that feeling of the cup in our playoff system, and so it makes it so that you know if you are a team that happens to do really well in the cup and you keep advancing, keep advancing, keep advancing, you still have something to fight for, right? Yeah. And so I would say our league, the way it, it seems to be working now is that yes, our regular season champion doesn't get a whole lot of love, even though by far it should be, you know, the best team in the league, but the Americans love a playoff setup. They love that any given Sunday, this team can beat this team and they're going forward type of feel. We've tried to kind of bridge a little bit to have our best teams in the finals by doing the playoff best of series. And so the idea is that the more games they play against the same teams, the more likelihood that the better team is going to advance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like we have created our own special combined regular season slash cup kind of championship feel that is very American in terms of the nature of how our tournaments work. And so I think it works really well for us as Americans to have that feeling. But do I miss that sense of, even if you are last place in the conference, right? And you're not making the playoffs. Do I wish that there was still something for those guys to fight for? Yes, we have our cup here, but you know, that's, that's a one-off and it's not for every team. So that's the only part of it. I think that would be, I think added to somehow with the relegation system is that it makes it so that every spot in the table is still a battle, you know, and it's fighting for something as opposed to just the teams that qualify for playoffs. Yeah. And in America, not only is there no incentive to fight, there's an incentive to lie down because you get a better draft pick in American sports. And, um, you know, I I was, I was going to mention about cup, you know, the NBA did a cup this year for the first time. And that's definitely the soccer influence and the fact that more Americans are watching European sports with these cups. I think it would be cool if the NBA lets like semi-pro teams and other types of leagues and see how they can compete against the, the NBA players are um, in, in a cup competition. Well, you mentioned a single entity, which I, I was not familiar with. That's interesting. But I know that DC United was given certain benefits initially because they wanted to have a, a good team in DC. Mm-hmm. So you got a chance to play in DC, where we where we are right now. Mm-hmm. That must have been a huge move to you to go to, I guess at the time was one of the, one of the better teams. Well, I guess Real Salt Lake was as well. But DC had a great uh, MLS tradition. So when I moved from Real Salt Lake to DC, DC was going through what I would call a little bit of a downturn. Oh, is that right? Um, oh, yeah. They had not made the playoffs in I think the last seven years, mm. and I was coming from a team that was perennially in the playoffs and had won the championship, and so um, I was part of what I would call a rebuilding period for DC as well um, under Ben Olson. Um, He was trying to bring in his players to kind of then bring up, you know, the team because they had not made the the playoffs, I think, in the last seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I came in, this time I'm one of the older guys. I'm one of the experienced pros. And so I was brought in more for my experience than I I was for like my football ability at that time. Um, And so I think, uh, you know, I definitely had a sense of like, you know, they were trying to build things. Now going to DC was, it was very much a personal decision for me because my wife had actually um, gotten a job as a lawyer um, working in DC. And so that's why I kind of wanted to end up in this area. And then with her working again, it gave me the opportunity to then try and decide about going back to school. Um, And so this is, you know, that was the kind of environment in which I kind of made that transition from Salt Lake to DC you know, I'd waited till my contract was up at Salt Lake um, and then kind of went over to D.C. to try and, you know, decide, you know, what my next best steps were, knowing that I only had a, a year or two or a couple of years left on my career. Um, and so when we got to D.C., I ended up, uh, you know, they had made playoffs in a while. They had, you know, pieces of a pretty decent team and they were trying to build. Um, and, you know, I think we again had a little bit of that lightning in the bottle feel that first year, um, because we made playoffs again, um, and ended up doing really well. And so I I think it was hopefully the, the, the start of kind of rebuilding that club back up to its former glory, because at the beginning of the MLS, DC was definitely the flagship team. 
um, mm -hmm. that had changed quite a bit um, since then. Um, but um, there is such, you know, especially when they're playing at RFK, is such a history of DC that kind of, you know, that those championships from old, those old players that were like legends everywhere you walk, you know, their pictures are plastered everywhere. You know what I mean? And so um, DC has so, is one of the few MLS teams that I think has, you know, roots all the way back to the beginning of the, of the league and not only roots, but like perennial champions at the beginning of the league. Um, you know, times have changed a little bit and they're still kind of looking to find their footing again. Um, but I definitely felt as if when I moved to DC, you know, I'd only planned to maybe play a year or two before going back to school. And then, you know, we did really well making it to the playoffs and, you know, um, you know, advancing somewhat. Um, and so that was a, a good feeling. And so, you know, would I have been able to play another year or two there possibly? Um, but I think at that point, you know, it was smart for me, given where my body was, um, to then decide if I, if I keep playing another year or two, you know, maybe I have problems walking when I'm 50, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or if I start and I have the ability to transition now, and this is when I was kind of applying to, you know, post back programs and medical schools, if I have the ability to kind of make the transition now, maybe I save a little bit of what is left in my body and then kind of start on a different pathway, a different career um, that I'm excited about. Um, so I think after that first year, uh, I, I made the decision that it was time for me to kind of step away and pursue what was now becoming my, my next kind of big passion and kind of, you know, uh, project, so to speak. That must have been really intimidating, though. Um, you know, you're, you're playing you're playing soccer for many years. I've talked to athletes who played overseas, and when they come back, they feel like everyone else got a head start on their career. Um, and, and, and these are folks that didn't make a lot of money in Europe playing basketball. They, you know, they, they kind of tooled around second and third divisions, had a great time, but didn't really build a career that their colleague, their counterparts did from their class. But yet, you know, you, you, you went to medical school, had to be very intimidating. Um, how were you able to stay sharp, uh, all those years and, you know, be ready to, you know, you know, instead of, instead of training on the pitch to, you know, really hit the books. Um, uh, to needless to say, it was a it was a big transition. Um, I I think one of the aspects of being in medicine, and it's something they talk about over and over again, is kind of like continued learning and mm -hmm. you know being a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. um, I felt as if you know, although I hadn't necessarily gone into medicine before that, I had always kind of been interested and I read a lot and I you know was always interested in kind of learning. And so it, it made it where when I was making that transition back to school, um, I approached school from like a much more mature kind of older perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it made it as in, you know, when you're younger and you're going to school or maybe going to college and you're learning your major, you know, unless you find that passion kind of, you know, uh, field or that passion kind of drive, it makes it very difficult to learn about things that, you know, you know, you have to learn, but you're not necessarily sure of why you're learning them or what you're going to use them for. Right. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to the end of my career, when I was you know making the decision to go back to medicine, I had a father-in-law that was an emergency medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he kind of gave me that, you know, spiel of what are you going to do after soccer when I was marrying his daughter? Um, and, and so, you know, I jokingly told him I was going to go into, to medicine, um, and thinking he would like laugh at me because I was a, you know, an athlete and, you know, and he was like, okay, what do you, what do you need to do to get in, into that? What do you have to do? And that was the first time I actually had someone kind of look at me and say, Hey, you could probably do this, you know, maybe just figure out if you want to. Um, and that's why, you know, when I was at Salt Lake, I had, spent the time while I was playing kind of doing shadowing and doing kind of scribing for the team doctors. Hmm. Um, and so they were kind of my first intro into medicine was kind of working with them in the clinics and kind of helping them see patients. Um, and that's when I first got that, you know, maybe medicine would be the next step for me. And so then when I finally made the decision to go back, I'd had some experience kind of working with doctors and working in like a doctor, you know, medical field. And so it wasn't, like I was going into a blind and just making the decision kind of, oh, I'm going to be a doctor, you know, 
um, you have to put in a little bit of research and a little bit of effort to kind of figure out, is this right for me? So that when you do make the transition, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You're going to have setbacks, but because you know, it's what you want to do, it makes it so much easier. Right. And so when you then go back to school, it's not going back to learn of like, oh, I'm being forced to learn this. It's now like, oh, I'm using this. This is going to help me when I'm doing what I want to do. So it's more important to learn this now. And that like kind of blew open school for me um, going back because it made it so much more, you know, it was applicable to what I was looking to do. And so it wasn't just learning something to learn it. It was learning something because I knew I wanted to use it. Yeah. Um, and it made it so much easier. Yeah. Well, you did your residency on hollowed, gra hollowed ground. You went to UVA and became a resident. Uh, what, what was that experience like, you know, uh, entering the, uh, enemy territory uh, to, to do your, uh, your medical work? So, so, I mean, of course, go who's, right? I'm, I'm all on board. Um, <laughs> the idea was is that, you know, when you're in the kind of postgraduate kind of programs in the fields there, you know, the, the undergraduate kind of athletic stuff, doesn't necessarily jump in your face quite as much, <laughs> uh, but you know, you know, when the big games are coming up, you know, when the big teams and, and it was always nice to be able to kind of go watch the teams play because they're right down the street. You know what I mean? And so yeah. when UVA played Duke, I'd go to those games and, you know, it, 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 it allowed me to kind of be closer to the teams. Um, uh, I think, you know, residency in itself especially medical residency is it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Um, it's very much a time consuming, um, you know, it, it encompasses everything you do like 24 seven, right? If you're not at the hospital, you're studying or eating or sleeping or doing one of the above, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's residency. Um, and residency during COVID was brutal. It was, it was really hard. And, and, and I, at the time, you know, I had uh, a wife who was recently pregnant and we didn't know how being exposed to COVID was going to affect the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, I had my in-laws who had come to help us out by kind of staying with my wife while I was in residency. Um, They're both older and kind of high risk for kind of COVID infection. And so there we made the decision for a large percentage of, you know, the second and third years of my residency where if I was gonna be in the hospital being exposed to COVID patients, I wouldn't go home to spend with the family. Um, I'd have to isolate. And the only time I would get to see the family is when I was able to do the seven days of isolation needed to kind of say I'm not COVID positive and then I could go home. But very few times in residency do you ever get seven days in a row where you're not kind of seeing patients, you know what I mean? So. Mm. Um, you know, there'd be like four or five, six months going by before I got to see my family other than over Zoom or, you know, and that was, that was so much harder than I, because, you know, when it's just residency and you're just doing about the, the hard work and doing that stuff, that I had no problem with, right? Mm -hmm. But the reason I had been doing it is to be close to my family, to be doing something that, you know, brought me to a, a space where I could kind of be around my family all the time. And then when that COVID hit, that kind of got taken away. It, it was a it was a whole level of how do I put it like obstacle of difficulty that I hadn't been prepared for you know um, and so I think you know making sure one that I really wanted to do it helped me but then once it was all happening and everything was going down it was the only thing that kept you driving to the next day was the fact that you know you had to keep an eye on the, the big picture. Um, and being an older kind of non-traditional, you know, medical student and resident kind of helped me with that because I knew what being alone with your time was from when I was playing, you know what I mean? When you're going to a different culture and you're all by yourself. And so all of those things kind of fed into helping me survive those obstacles, you know? Um, but, you know, being at UVA, what really helped was that it was a, it was a resident program that was used to having people who had kids, people who had families. And so they were a little bit more accommodating than some other residencies. Um, it also helped that we weren't one of the major disaster zones like in New York, you know, or the big cities, but we had our own kind of trials and tribulations um, during COVID. But um, I, I really, you know, I'm thankful for my UVA kind of fellow residents and my UVA kind of instructors at that time, because they're they're what got, got the residents through because, 
you know, when you were at some of the other entities where they weren't supporting the residents, mm -hmm. you know, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and you were hearing stories from the other residents that were just nightmarish. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that being a UVA, you know, really gave me a love for that school because, you know, it got me through one of the hardest times of my life. How long were you at UVA? Um, so the residency there is three years. Three years? Wow. Good. Yeah. So, well, look, uh, Russ, this, this, this has been uh, great, great, great to meet you. Um, uh, Robbie, I just called you by your last name. Great yeah. to meet you. I've really, I've really enjoyed this. But, but uh, last question for you. Um, you know, I, I would think being an ER doctor would have some of the adrenaline rush that you get when you're playing in a Champions League or, or a big time soccer match without, without the glamour and the paparazzi and, and, <laughs> and all that stuff. But I, I would think it would be, a, it, would, it would be that type of job and you have to be on, you have to be prepared. Uh, how, how would you compare uh, being a doctor to being a professional soccer player? Um, there are definitely moments that feel like you're stepping up to take a penalty that no. could decide. <laughs> but in this situation, it, it it's, it's different because, you know, oftentimes it's someone's life that you're kind of dealing with. Um, and, you know, the same that goes into that, you know, you have to break it down into smaller, more manageable aspect to it, right? Like, I can't think, oh, I have so much life in my hands. You know what I mean? Because that's too much, right? Mm -hmm. I have to think, okay, what is the next thing I can fix? What is the next thing I can kind of get them through? And so having that experience, you know, the same way of going up to take that penalty, I can't think, oh, if I miss this, we're done. If I, you know, if I make it, we're champions. That's the thing. It's more of a, listen, you're just taking a penalty. You've taken millions of these penalties before. It's the simplest thing in the world. You have all the advantages at your disposal. Just walk up and take a penalty. You know what I mean? And so it, that experience of like being in those really high risk situations, but being able to break it down into what is the next thing I can do? What is the next thing I can accomplish? You know, makes it so that it's not quite as daunting uh, an aspect. And so that when you do succeed, when do things go well, you can then look back at it and be like, that was amazing. But always in the moment, it never feels that way, you know? Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that there's parts of that in kind of being an emergency medicine doctor. Um, and then there's parts of it of being just a good teammate you know, being part of a, a medical team that's trying to take care of someone um, has all helped me, all brought full force into kind of making me a better player. You know, be uh, it made me a good soccer player and it's made me a better doctor. Yeah. Well, look, Rob, this, is, this has been great. I'm so thankful for Peter for suggesting this. Uh, you've had an incredible journey. You're very thoughtful in how you uh, discuss your journey. And uh, I'm sorry for making you second guess yourself so many times today. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to meet you in person. You know, obviously I'm a 25 year resident of Arlington. So I'm there all the time. So if you ever have time to get a coffee or something, that'd be great. But I really enjoyed meeting you. This has been great. Uh, yeah, ho hopefully I could, uh, we can meet in person and, and continue this discussion. That'd be great. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, well, thanks again. And have, have, have a great day and let's keep in touch. All right. You too. Okay.